بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Today's seerah is going to be a bit of a tangent We have to catch up with uh, issues in the life of the Prophet وسلم, that we have overlooked Remember we're talking about uh, the battle of Tabuk for five uh, episodes We talked about the delegations and the delegations spanned three and a half to four years Right? We went over all the delegations So there are things happening in the life of the Prophet وسلم, that we kind of overlooked. So today, and maybe even the next seerah, uh, I will shed some light on uh, these incidents. And in order to do so, I'm going to have to once again go non-chronological. Because as we already noticed, if I did the delegations non-chronologically, if I did the delegations chronologically, it would have been too much. Every time I mention delegations, rather boring. Whether if you lump them all together, it actually makes sense, right? So today, we're also going to do one particular uh, issue, but is going to span the course of around two and a half years. And uh, it is these two and a half years, the eighth, the ninth, and the uh, tenth year of the Hijrah. And uh, I wanted to begin by talking about the death of the son of the Prophet Sallallahu And that is, of course, Ibrahim. Okay, but in order to talk about Ibrahim, we need to talk about Maria. And of course, the topic of Maria is a very sensitive one. Nonetheless, uh, I would rather you hear these things from me uh, than to be exposed by people who do not believe in Allah and His Messenger. And I would rather we discuss them frankly uh, in the confines of an Islamic ethos and environment before uh, other people uh, misinterpret. And, and, and I mean, the fact of the matter is that these topics sometimes are glossed over in modern Sira books, right? Most modern authors just gloss over them. They don't really delve too deep into them. Uh, maybe in a pre-internet world it would have made sense, but not anymore. Not anymore at all. There's no point hiding information or pretending it doesn't exist because you're not going to get anywhere. And I will tell you from my own experiences as being a, a, a da'i, a lot of times our young brothers and sisters contact me and they've heard of a verse of the Quran or a hadith or something that they've never been taught in Sunday school and this causes them doubt about Islam. And this isn't like people lying about the tradition. This is things found in our tradition that are simply glossed over. And when this young man or this young woman hears it for the first time, he's like, I can't believe this. You know, this can't be true. Tell me it's not true. The hadith is in Bukhari, let's say. Tell me it's not true. I'm sorry, man, I can't tell you it's not true. It is true. But the problem comes that we assume there's going to be the sheltered lifestyle, right? Not in accordance with uh, the teachings of, uh, you know, our tradition. And so therefore, these types of issues come about. So uh, because of this, I felt that it is imperative that I talk about it from within an Islamic framework as, as much as possible. And in the end, it is not my job or anybody's job to distort what happened. It is my job to convey and teach, and if people like it, they like it. If people do not like it, that is not a rejection of me. It is a rejection of uh, Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger. So, uh, Maria, her name was Maria binti Shamun, and Maria was gifted uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu by Juraih ibn Mina. Uh, that's the name given in the books of Sira, uh, of Sira Juraih ibn Mina. And uh, Juraih was the Muqawqis of Egypt. What is the Muqawqis? The Muqawqis is a title. Just like the Caesar, uh, just like the Kisra, it's a title. And it was given to the uh, Patriarch of Egypt. Now, the books of Sira typically say this is the ruler of Egypt. But this is simply incorrect. Because Egypt at the time was not independent. Egypt at the time was under Byzantine rule, the Roman Empire. So... Technically, it is not correct. This is not an independent kingdom. Rather, this is a government appointed. This is a person appointed by Rome. He might have been Egyptian, maybe. But he was not a king. He was a patriarch appointed by the Roman uh, Empire. And of course, back then, they appointed religious people. Because remember, there was no separation of church and state. Back in those days, that they're appointing uh, religious people. So they're appointing a, uh, a patriarch. And... It looks like this patriarch, if you look at the books of history, uh, is Cyrus of Alexandria, right? Cyrus has been changed to Juraih. So Cyrus was his actual uh, Latin name, and then the Arabicized version is Juraih. Cyrus of Alexandria, and because the Muslims conquered Egypt within 20 years, it just turned out that this was the final Byzantine 
prefect was the title, prefect uh, over Egypt. And this Cyrus, he was a Melekite Christian, and the Melekites were, uh, there were no Catholics or Protestants at the time, we're talking about 620, 610 CE, this is pre-Catholic and pre-Protestant, and they had other, they had Nestorians, they had Melekites, they had Maronites, um, uh, and others, so uh, the Melekites become uh, Greek Orthodox and Roman Orthodox, sorry, Roman Catholic, so this is pre Roman Catholic, and to this day, the Greek Orthodox Church admires this person, Cyrus. The Greek Orthodox is somewhat similar to that tradition, and so they admire uh, this person, Cyrus. So the Prophet sent him a letter to Islam, and uh, this letter is probably around the eighth year of the Hijrah. We talked about him sending letters to so many different people. We have no reports from Egypt about him receiving the letter and what his response was. Unlike the Caesar, we know what his response was in Rome. We have absolutely no reports. However, it is not too far-fetched to assume that he recognized the process as being true and that is why he was so polite to him. We don't know this for a fact, but it is an assumption to be made that neither did he tear the letter up, nor did he reject, nor did he ridicule, rather he gifted expensive gifts. He gave a mini fortune and he wrote back a very polite letter to the Prophet wasallam. and therefore it's not too much of a stretch to make an assumption that this man, and he was a patriarch, which means he was a, uh, an elder in the church, and he is well known, he actually is a well known theologian. Uh, Cyrus of Alexandria is well known in the Greek Byzantine church as being uh, an alim, if you like, right from their perspective. He wrote books, he wrote about Jesus Christ and you know the nature of Jesus Christ. He has his theories, which is a very important topic for, for Christians. How do you reconcile the nature of the divine with the nature of the human? The point being, he's not a jahil. He's an alim from their tradition, and he responds with a lot of kindness and dignity. Perhaps he recognizes, but as is typical, he doesn't want to uh, convert. And so, what does he do? He sends a mini fortune. He sends a thousand mithqal of gold, like a thousand sashels of gold. That's a fortune. And he sends many fine garments. And he sends a donkey that was called duldul. And this is the, the Prophet ﷺ took this donkey and this is the famous Duldul that was gifted to him from uh, Egypt. And he sent a servant by the name of Ma'bur. So a servant by the name of Ma'bur. He sent honey and he sent many other gifts and amongst those gifts were two sister slave girls by the name of Maria and Sirin. Maria and Sirin. And these two girls were of course Christians and uh, some later books they mention that these uh, girls were gifted to the church by their noblemen fathers. Now they had a custom, the church, and we know this even from the story of uh, Maryam and Zachariah, right? They had this, this custom of gifting uh, to the church. And so the patriarch basically uh, now has control over this. And so the patriarch, the Cyrus, he gifts these two. And it is mentioned that these were uh, daughters of a noble family, but now of course they are the slaves of the church, right? Because they're gifted to the church. And so the patriarch gifts uh, these two to uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the books of Sirah that do mention these things, they mention that uh, these two obviously uh, young ladies were uh, exceedingly uh, beautiful. And because they were two sisters, and you cannot have two sisters at one time, so the Prophet gifted uh, Sirin to Hassan ibn Thabit, the poet. So Hassan ibn Thabit, and they had a child by the name of Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan ibn Thabit, and he kept uh, Maria for himself. And uh, ibn Sa'ad mentions that when the Prophet received the letter from Muqawqis, from Cyrus, uh, it was a polite letter, all of these gifts. So he said, the Khabith, this evil person has managed to preserve his kingdom by being polite to me. But his kingdom will not last. This is the last of his kingdom. Which means that he will be the last of his dynasty. But because he was polite to me, he will not be harmed in this world. And so he dies a natural death. And of course, as a prediction, he becomes the last prefect because Amr ibn Aus conquers. Uh, Egypt, okay? So, uh, this was a, a type of prediction uh, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, 
Of course, the difficult issue for today is, of course, the whole concept of gifting Maria and uh, Sirin. And the fact of the matter is that uh, in the culture that we have been raised in, and I am a part of this culture like everybody else, this is a topic that is simply impossible to talk about without some type of bias. And the fact of the matter is that we are all biased in one direction, and that is we believe the Prophet to be a prophet. That is a legitimate bias. It's not a bad bias, right? And therefore, we will automatically view everything that he has done as being something that is permissible and sanctioned by Allah, at least for the time and place, even if it's not uh, in our times, because there are some things that we can say are permissible back then, but now the Ummah has agreed to uh, move on, and uh, this is one of those issues as I will come to. Uh, so, if you believe that the Prophet was a Prophet, and that is our belief, then we accept that these things were morally permissible, and if you don't believe this, then uh, it's not my job to really convince uh, in, with regards to the story of Maria, and the fact of the matter is that no amount of sugar coating removes this reality that Maria and her sister Sirin they were not wives of the Prophet Sallallahu of course Sirin is not he's not uh, she became uh, the, the servant of uh, the concubine of um, Hassan they were not wives but they were Milkul Yameen they were Milkul Yameen and it does appear we know for we know pretty much for a fact that she later on converted to Islam but she was not a Muslim when she came and in our Sharia, one cannot take a Muslim as a milkul yameen. Uh, that this is not something that is allowed. That a person who is a Muslim, we don't uh, take them as abid or jawadi, and then make them milk yameen. So she comes as a Christian, and she converts at some later unspecified unspecified time. We do not know when that time is. And uh, she is very much what the uh, Bible itself calls a concubine. This is the term that the Bible itself has. Now, we as Muslims like to point out that whenever a Christian or a Jewish person says, oh, how could your prophet have so many wives and, and a concubine? Immediately our response is what? Look at... So look at Solomon, look at David, look at so and so, look and so. The fact of the matter is that the asl or the basic ruling is that the biblical prophets had multiple wives and most of them had concubines. The Bible mentions Abraham and Moses, of course David and Solomon. I mean David has uh, over 700, Solomon has over a thousand, this is according to the Bible, over a thousand ladies between wives and uh, concubines put together, over a thousand. So we point out, how can you criticize our process and for having one for most of his life, for more than 25 years of his life, he literally had one. And then in the last few years, he, when he was in his 50s and 60s, he married nine. How can you compare nine to 900 or 1,000? So we point this out, and that's a valid point to make to a Christian or a, uh, a faithful Christian or Jew. But the problem is in our times, there are few faithful Christians and Jews, and they are also being eliminated from the picture, and more and more people are turning agnostic, and they have no problem criticizing these biblical fi figures as well, and so with them, you really cannot quote the past at all, because they will say that's also wrong, what they did, okay? And to that person, all that we can say, and this is the max, as much as we can say, is that that was a different world, and a different time, and a different place, and a different custom, and a different role. And people across the globe had different views about uh, this notion. And while I was doing my research today, I actually came across a, a Jewish website, uh, Q&A, like we have Islamic Q&A, they have another equivalent. And a questioner is asking the rabbi, that how can I understand that Solomon used hundreds of thousands of slaves to build the temple? Doesn't this go against, you know, humanism and, and, and being nice and whatnot? Now, he's not asking about the slave girls. He's asking about slaves because the Bible says that he used 100,000 slaves to build the, uh, the grand uh, temple. So this man is saying, I feel disgusted and how can I be a Jew after this? How could our prophet have used, uh, he's talking from himself's perspective, you know, all of these slaves. So this rabbi, his name is Rabbi Perry Rank from New York, he responds, and I, uh, this is basically a response we can give, that the thing about history is it does tend to be brutal, and it strips us about our most cherished illusions about the past. So whenever we delve into history, we have to approach it cautiously, knowing that we might not return the same way we entered it. It's going to change our perception. Solomon was a great builder. 
and as such he needed workers whom he secured through the institution of uh, basically slaves or forced labor. This was not an uncommon practice in ancient times. So how shall we read this? Shall we read it as slavery or as employment? He's calling slaves employment because that's, and then he goes on. Has Solomon enslaved the masses or has he provided them jobs? We tend to think of slavery as an ultimate evil of sorts. Here's the point. But the fact is that this was an accepted form of labor for thousands of years. And our disillusionment with it is only recent, 300 years old. And only about 150 years, especially here in uh, America. And then he goes on, the Torah has very extensive rules about how to treat slaves, the idea was to humanize and to civilize. And, and so he's basically defending the classical notion of slavery. This is a modern you know, Jewish rabbi in New York. Because they have the same problem we do. And that is the tradition clearly mentions slaves being used by the... Uh, now, of course, we don't have any equivalent of 100,000 slaves being used in mass labor. We have one Maria that was treated very nicely. She has her own house. She's not uh, you know, working in the fields. But in the end of the day, from modern standards, this is not something that most modern humans would find palatable, right? And so we do need to, as much as we can, explain. So he says, this is not a defense of slavery. And I have to agree with everything he says here. I, like you, am a child of the anti-slavery movement of modern times. Meaning, we're living in modern times where everybody has agreed we should be anti-slavery. But let's realize that once upon a time, that wasn't the notion in history. And to read what goes on in ancient times through our contemporary eyes. And then to judge it is really not fair to our ancestors. This is what the rabbi is saying. You cannot look through the lens of 2014 as you look at 620 CE and then expect them to have everything like we did. The world was a very different place and everybody accepted it. And this is really harsh to say, but even the slaves of the time accepted it. That was the way that they were. And again, this is not a defense of slavery, but it is what... Now, here's another thing that I have to say here, and that is that uh, the way that the slavery has existed in America in the 1800s is perhaps the most brutal manifestation of this institution in the history of humanity. That, realistically speaking, the way that America used slaves, imported them, caught free people, and brought them here, and used them worse than cattle and animals, and mistreated them and considered them to be inhumane. Even the ancient Greeks were better to their slaves than this reality. So one of the byproducts of being so harsh towards slaves was the anti-abolitionist movement came out of that, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But the point is that we need to understand, and this is not sugarcoating, this is a fact that slavery did not exist in Islamic lands the way that it existed in America. That's for sure. This is not to sugarcoat. There was slave. Of course there were slaves. But, uh, and I have a number of quotes, but I don't, we don't have time to get into them. But it is very true, historically speaking. And there are quotes that I can bring to you. Maybe we'll have another talk about this, historically speaking. That the first Europeans that visited Ottoman lands and visited Muslim lands and interacted with um, basically Muslims, they were amazed at how the slaves were treated in Muslim lands compared to how they're treated in European lands. So they're amazed at how gentle, how kind the slave, one of them marks the slave speaks back to the master that, you know, cut back my work or whatever. I mean, he'll actually argue with the master. And we know from, from our Islamic history that some slaves even became kings. The Mamluk dynasty, which was the most prestigious dynasty that fought against the Mongols, right? Genghis Khan's hordes or the great, great grandson of Genghis Khan. The Mamluk, what, what does Mamluk mean? It's called the slave dynasty. Literally, Mamluk means slave. And this dynasty was a dynasty of slaves who eventually rose to power and became the Khulafa. And they ruled over the Muslim world for almost 500 years up until the advent of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1792. I mean, it's really bizarre. Napoleon fought the Mamluks. Napoleon's fighting with guns. The Mamluks are fighting with swords. That's one of the reasons why they lost. Okay? And that was the beginning of modernity. Muhammad Ali Pasha of Egypt came and then modernization began because the Mamluks were destroyed. Point being that who were the Mamluks? They were a slave dynasty. Okay, so 
In the end of the day, yes, we can add all of these points. There's only so much rationalization that I can do, only so much sugarcoating. If somebody wants to find fault with what happened, then honestly, this is the perspective of 2014 being back projected onto 610. There's nothing I can do about that, okay? But I, as a Muslim who believes this man to be a prophet of Allah, I accept this was acceptable for the time and the place. And we also have to add here, this is compounded by the fact that in modern times we have these uh, extremist groups that are now starting this whole notion of entrapping and basically conquering innocent women and then making them into slaves, right? We have the Boko Haram, we have the ISIS, we have all of this. So this obviously complicates it. And you then have people saying, oh look, they're basing this on uh, the process. And this is ludicrous because what Boko Haram is doing is haram. Because, why is this? Because, well, many reasons. The most obvious one, the Sharia completely and uncategorically forbids taking a free person and making them into a slave. There is a channel to become a slave. And that is prisoners of war who are not ransomed off. Okay? It is absolutely uncategorically haram. Like what Boko Haram has done is to invade a Christian village and take schoolgirls in broad daylight and then make them into uh, slaves. Or what ISIS is doing with the Yazidi families. What wrong have they done? Where, where is the sin or the crime? Where is the jihad being waged? Who is the Khalifa? Where are the prisoners? This is complete haram. So we're not even, you know, there's no comparison at all with what is happening in modern times uh, with um, uh, what happened in the past. And also, of course, there's another point, and that is that uh, scholars of our era have agreed that slavery is now a thing of the past. Just like in other faith traditions where, yes, there were times when slavery was practiced and they justified it. But now, in the era that we live in, I don't know of any scholar of our tradition. I don't know of a single alim that is calling for a return to slavery. T things have moved on. And... I'll give you just one example of this that uh, I know for a fact my own uh, dear teacher, Sheikh uh, Muhammad bin Saleh al Uthaymin, Sheikh Uthaymin, a very famous alim, of course, he's passed away uh, more than a decade and a half ago. Uh, but uh, when the Bosnian War was taking place, and this is in the early 90s, he was very much involved with giving advice to the people. And that was a legitimate war, a legitimate jihad. Everybody acknowledges that the Serbs were massacring the Muslims. There was so much bloodshed. The UN, as you know, has done a tribunal and a crimes court against the Serb leaders, right? Everybody acknowledges that this was a legitimate jihad, that Muslims had to defend themselves. I know for a fact that Sheikh ibn Uthameen uh, was asked by some of the people on the ground, we have prisoners of war, we can't ransom them off. Can we take them as milk yameen? And the Sheikh said, no, this is not allowed in our times. And this is a Sheikh that is generally considered very ultra-conservative, very hardline, whatnot. Of course, that's the, the way they perceive him. I consider him to be a great alim. But the point being, this is a faqih. He understands you can't do this. This is not something we resurrect from the books of fiqh. Right? So this is something that very clearly our scholars have understood that, no, you don't do this anymore. That's something that, okay, it was permissible for the time. Now it's not something that uh, we need to uh, resurrect. And so uh, the point is that our Prophet was indeed gifted Maria. Maria was not our mother. She's not of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen. So we do not view her as being of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen. She was Milk Yameen. She remained milk yameen. And she was never a zawja. And if she had become a zawja, she would be of the ummahat al-mu'mineen. And so uh, our Prophet uh, was gifted Maria. And of course we know that uh, Maria gave birth to uh, the son of our Prophet Sallallahu And that is uh, Ibrahim. And uh, there's one story that is also mentioned about Maria. And again, I mean, I've already mentioned to you a big issue about the whole issue of Maria, but I would rather you hear these things from me again, rather than you hear about them from some other uh, website or other person, then, you know, this causes doubts. And again, wallahi, I'll be honest with you, if we lived in a different time and different place, not everything needs to be mentioned. You know, it's not, you just, okay, some things are healthy, some things, there's no need to, sh you know, put the spotlight on them. But I feel very strongly from my own experiences in the time and place we live in, it is better that we 
talk about this in a frank manner because we don't want our youth. Wallahi, even last week I got a call, you know, from one of our uh, youngsters. He had literally, he had told me he is not a Muslim anymore. But his parents wanted me to talk to him or whatnot. Yeah, he's a murtad. And he said this, I don't believe anymore. And he's quoting a number of things from the seerah. From the seerah. And these are things that are mentioned in the books. It's not something that, you know, uh, it's not, no, where did he hear about it from? Not from me. Not from, where did he hear, who, what do you think? Well, in particular. Yeah, probably yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, so he heard it from Islamophobes. He heard it from people that have this agenda and he's logged onto their websites and they put all of these narrations, one from this year, one from that year, and they ignore, you know, so many other stories that are just amazing, that are, form the character of the Prophet And they concentrate on these two, three, four, and sometimes they'll bring a little bit exaggeration, but they're not lying, and that's the point. They understand now it's to you can't lie anymore. They quote directly from, you know, At-Tabarani or Ibn Ishaq or whatever, and they bring five, ten incidents, and, you know, this young kid said, I just can't believe that this is a, you know, and this is what he said. So, you know, I'm telling you in all honesty, if we lived in a different time and place, wallahi, let's just move on. But we don't. I would rather we talk about it and clarify so that we understand. And then, uh, you know, uh, whoever wants to then have a different position or whatnot, our job is to convey the message. It's up to them to believe what they want. So, and of course, this is not, it's scandalous for Maria, but not for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is that uh, Maria was not a Muslim at the time. And... She is, of course, coming to a strange land, and she probably does not speak the language of Arabic. And so uh, one can kind of understand that, you know, she's all alone in a strange land. So rumors began to spread that the servant that was gifted along with Maria, his name was Ma'bur, uh, was visiting Maria. Okay, so rumors began to spread of this nature, and you understand what these rumors entail. Uh, and so, uh, some reports also mention that this servant, Ma'bur, was a relative, like a distant cousin or something of Maria, uh, which would also then, you know, make it uh, like they have some connection from back as well. And so, uh, and this hadith is reported in Sahih Muslim, by the way. So it's clearly, it's not something in some obscure, uh, the hadith I'm going to mention. It's not in some obscure book. It's mentioned in pr pretty much every single book, uh, you know, uh, of the Sunan and whatnot. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded Ali ibn Abi Talib to take his sword and find Ma'bur. I.e. deal with the man. Find this person Ma'bur. And of course, Ali is assigned, radiallahu anhu, these tasks because anything to do with the personal family of the Prophet ﷺ, it's Ali. Okay? So anything to do with the personal family of the Prophet ﷺ, Ali is the man that is chosen because he is Al al Bayt. He is a part of the family of the Prophet. ﷺ. So Ali took the sword and he said, asked a very intelligent question. He said, O Messenger of Allah, should I go as uh, a, a silent uh, person who just obeys the command? Or should I go as somebody who hears and sees what the person absent will not hear and see? Meaning, do you want me to investigate or do you want me to just do? What do you want? So he asked an intelligent question. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, no, go as somebody who hears and sees, i.e. find out. You do investigation. And this, by the way, I'll just jump the gun here. So because of this phrase, Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Hazm and others, they say that the Prophet ﷺ was not sending Ali to execute Ma'pur. He was sending him to frighten him and to find out. And the other position, which is the position also found, is that he was being sent to execute Ma'pur. So this is a bit of a controversy because you have fiqhi points, fiqhi ramifications based upon this. Do you understand the fiqhi ramifications? The main fiqhi ramification, Ma'pur was not given a trial. Evidence was not presented. Two witnesses were not found. And Ali is being told, here's the knife, go do it. Okay. So one opinion says that the Prophet ﷺ had this right. Of course, they all say nobody else has this right. I mean, understood. I mean, that's clearly, maybe I should mention it. You know, that's something for the Prophet ﷺ. But the other opinion, which is Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Hazm and others, they say, no, this is not judge, jury, and executioner. This is the Prophet ﷺ sending Ali to, in, you know, basically frighten and interrogate. And that's why he tells Ali, use your ears and eyes. Figure out what's happening. And so, Ali ibn Abi Talib 
uh, goes and finds Ma'bur. According to one report, he was in a uh, uh, he was in a date grove collecting dates or uh, perhaps um, getting water. And when Ma'bur saw him, he became terrified. And there's again multiple reports over here. Uh, one report mentions that. Uh, he attempted to climb up a tree but then fell down. Another report mentions that he intentionally exposed his aura. In either case, his aura was exposed. In either case, what happened? Either he fell down or he intentionally exposed it. And lo and behold, uh, it was obvious that he had been uh, castrated. In fact, castration is not the word. He had been, uh, how shall we put this? Mutilated. That's the best way we can say this, right? He did not have uh, the organ that a man has. Uh, so, of course, this is what some of the civilizations did to slaves. Of course, in our tradition, this is always prohibited. You cannot do this ever, ever. It's never allowed to do this. Even to a legitimate slave, you cannot do this. But, of course, other civilizations didn't have that rule. So, uh, it was then clear to Ali that the rumors can't be true. That he doesn't even have this. So, uh, he then returned to the Prophet and informed him that basically uh, this is not something that uh, is uh, the case. And as I said, um, Ibn al-Qayyim and others have mentioned that this is something to frighten him and not as, a, as an executioner. Uh, in any case, so that issue was resolved and uh, in Dhul Hijjah of the eighth year of the Hijrah, in Dhul Hijjah, uh, Maria gives birth to a son and of course, our Prophet ﷺ was especially happy. Now, we don't know when Maria embraced Islam. I tried my best to look up as many books as I could. I could not find the time when Maria embraced Islam. So was it before this? Was it after this? We don't know. Okay, But one can assume that living with the Prophet ﷺ, obviously you will embrace Islam. You will see the Prophet of Allah, you will interact with him. So one can assume that by the time Maria is born, so now she is a different person. She has now uh, embraced Islam. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, hadith is in Sahih Muslim and others, that he came to the masjid uh, beaming with joy. The brothers, the Sahaba saw him smiling. And he said, last night a baby boy was born to me and I shall call him the name of my father, Ibrahim. Father is Ibrahim. I'll call him the name of my father, Ibrahim. And he said about Maria that her child has freed her. Her child has freed her. And this means that, uh, <clears throat> this, what this means is that uh, this is a ruling that our religion has, which is an interesting ruling, which again shows you the way that slavery was practiced in Islam is very different than the way it is in any other civilization. That in our Sharia, if a, a concubine gives birth well, of course, the child will be fully legitimate and exactly the same as all other children in inheritance, in wiratha, in uh, the taking the name of the father and taking the status of the father. And I should have mentioned most of our khulafa of the Umayyads and the, of the Abbasids especially and the Ottomans, almost all of them were sons of slave, slaves. So being the son of a slave did not have any type of negative smear at all. In fact, even uh, Hajar right, and Ismail, right, this is the same thing. Okay, so the point being that uh, in our Sharia, when the slave has a child, when such a concubine has a child, automatically she gets a free upgrade. What is this free upgrade? The Sharia calls her Umm al-Walad. Umm al-Walad. And Umm al-Walad means that she is no longer a concubine. She has certain privileges and rights. And of them is she cannot be sold, she cannot be transferred, she cannot uh, be treated like a slave, and she will become free as soon as her husband or owner, in this case, passes away. Okay, so this is a Umm al Walad. Okay. So we can say this that Islam is coming close to this issue of absolving slavery. That every single uh, lady that gives birth. You cannot, and this is Wallahi so humane. How can you then get rid of the lady who gave birth to your own son or daughter? Right? It becomes haram to do this. And this lady is now upgraded from Milk Yameen to Umm al Walad. And when you become Umm al Walad, so as soon as the owner dies, you become automatically free. Nobody can be your owner after that. So our Prophet gave the fiqh ruling through Maria, A'taqaha Waladuha. The fact that she has a child, now she's a free lady now that she's going to become a free 
lady. And uh, <clears throat> one of the ladies of the Ansar, they volunteered to uh, become a foster mother. In fact, the books of Sira mentioned there was a competition, uh, eagerness. A lot of women came to want to be a foster mother to the child and this also shows us by the way this is a custom that has almost disappeared from our time but it was very common for ladies to volunteer to help out and to be a foster uh, child to uh, children and every mother knows it's so difficult to raise a newborn an infant and this is what they would do they would help one another out and they would just take the child and you know help out in, in rearing the child so one of the ladies of the Ansar and her name is mentioned in the books she basically the process agreed that she should be the the wet nurse if you like uh, and so uh, she takes charge of the child for some periods as well and the process gave her some stipend for that as well because this is a a paid job that it is done uh, and Ibrahim lived for a year and some reports say a year and four months some reports say a year and six months so basically between this amount of time, around 18 months. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of any hadith that mentions any incident uh, within this year and a half. I don't know of anything. I tried again to look up and to the best of my knowledge, I was not able to find any incident about uh, you know, something with this young boy. Uh, Allah knows best, most likely, you know, there's not something that they narrated onwards. And again, this is one of the sad realities of the seerah. We only have what the Sahaba uh, told us about and perhaps there was nothing other than the fact that he's a baby boy with the process of seen with him we don't know much about uh, uh, that and so what we do know is that in the first quarter of the 10th year of the hijrah uh, when the process and barely has less than a year left to live basically um, that his son passed away and uh, for those of us who are parents in this room, uh, you all know not only that the passing of a son or daughter is the most painful thing, but that the age of a month, a year and a half is the most tender and the most uh, cute, adorable age, right? The terrible twos haven't begun yet, okay? And it is at that age where there's... The, the child is walking, laughing, running, waddling around. The child recognizes you. It's grunting and groaning in its own way. I mean, that is the cutest, cutest age. We all know this as parents, okay? And then after that, subhanAllah, kind of goes downhill. But anyway, alhamdulillah, parents are parents. We have to deal with it as it exists. But uh, at that age, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that Ibrahim uh, pass away. And there are many reports in the seerah about his death. There are not that many reports about his life because I'm assuming it was a nondescript. I mean, what you would expect a child, the process was seen with him. What are you going to report about that? You know, I mean, it's nothing that is above and beyond. But um, uh, his death, of course, is something that is reported in every single book of Hadith in Bukhari Muslim. Every book of Hadith reports the death of uh, Ibrahim and um, some of the, uh, the books mention that the news came that Ibrahim has fallen sick and he's about to die. So we can assume, you know, the doctors, of course, at the time, they knew that uh, symptoms of death have begun. So the information is, is told and conveyed to the process. And the process and visited uh, Maria and Maria lived in a place in Medina called Al-Awali. Al Awali, and uh, coincidentally, I used to live there as well uh, in that area. They're still called Al Awali to this day after 14 centuries. It is still called the Medina, by the way. The names of the areas of Medina are pretty much the same Harra Sharqiya, Harra Gharbiya, you know, Al Awali. These are still from the Sira. You still have them. So, uh, coincidentally, I didn't know Awali was also where Ali ibn Abi Talib had a house. Uh, where Maria had a house, so a number of Sahaba had their houses in that vicinity and just coincidentally when I came, the apartment I found was actually in uh, in Awali uh, and so Maria was, was in Awali and so the Prophet visited uh, Maria and some of the Sahaba went with uh, him to see Ibrahim and uh, he held Ibrahim in his hand and Ibrahim was wheezing and coughing and you could tell that the pangs of death had begun and the tears began to fall from the face of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was when uh, one of the Sahaba said, Awatabki Ya Rasulullah, you also cry, O Messenger of Allah, you also cry. So this shows us that he rarely cried in public. And that to see him cry was a shock to some of the Sahaba. They're asking him, like, are you human as well? You can cry as well. Awatabki Ya Rasulullah. And so uh, he responded with his famous phrase that the eyes cry. And the heart is sad, but we only say that which will please our Lord. The eyes cry and the heart is sad, 
but we only say that which will please our Lord, and were it not for the decree of Allah to pass, and that the latter amongst us shall meet the earlier, meaning those who die will meet those who have already died. Okay, so Ibrahim, you're dying, but I too will die and I'll meet up with you. So he's saying, were it not for the qadr of Allah, it must take place. And that eventually we'll all be together, we would have been much more grieved at your departure. So this shows us two things to console us when somebody dies. Number one, qadr Allah. Allah has decreed, what can you do? And number two, inshallah, it's only a matter of time, then all of us will be together in Jannah. Right? So these are the two things that you console yourself with when somebody passes away. That, Qadr Allah, what are you going to do? Allah's decree. Allah has willed it. Kullu nafsin da'akhatul maut. And then, alhamdulillah, death is not something that is um, a permanent departure because you will also die. So when your loved one departs, it's only a matter of time before you depart as well. Then when the both of you have departed, inshallah, you will be together. So this is what the Prophet is saying. And then he reiterated that truly we are sad, but we only say that which pleases our Lord. Okay, so this shows us what does sabr mean? Sabr means you control your tongue and your actions. Sabr has nothing to do with emotions. You can feel sad, you can cry, this is fine. Sabr has nothing to do with that. Sabr means you control what you say and you control what you do. You don't start wailing and, 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 and saying, how am I going to live and this is, why is this happening to me? No, we control our tongue and we control our limbs as well. And alhamdulillah, by and large, most Muslim societies have stopped this practice. Unfortunately, still around in some, practice, some cultures of beating oneself or, or, or pulling the hair. But alhamdulillah, I would say most Muslim societies have kind of eliminated these pre-Islamic jahili uh, practices. And the books of hadith mentioned that Ibrahim uh, Salat al-Janazah was prayed for him. So from this we learn we pray janazah for a young boy. Salat al-Janazah was prayed for him. And uh, we learned that the Prophet used four takbirat. So from this we learned there's four takbirat in Salat al-Janazah, as we know, four takbirat. And that Ibrahim was buried in Baqi' in a graveyard that is still known to this day. And every time I, we go to, well, our group goes whenever, uh, inshallah, this year as well, when we go next month for those of you who are going. So one of the things we'll do is make a tour of Baqi' and uh, I'll show you exactly where, inshallah ta'ala, in one month from now, inshallah, I'll show you exactly where the grave of Ibrahim is and uh, the other graves as well uh, of the wives of the Prophet and others that's in Baqi' al-Gharqad. So he was buried in Baqi' in a place that is well known to this day. And subhanAllah, look at how many deaths of the family of the Prophet that he had to suffer from the beginning to the end. Ibrahim died less than one year before our Prophet died. Literally at 62 years old now. You know, one would think he's gone through so much suffering. His mother, you know, his father has died before he's born. His mother dies. His grandfather, Abu Talib, you know, his, his confidant and wife of 25 years, Khadija, you know, passes away. Everybody's passing. Every single son of his and daughter of his dies other than Fatima. All three of his daughters are already dead by this time. So that's why he was extra happy at the birth of Ibrahim, that he only has Fatima left. Everybody has died, right? So he's extra happy at the birth of Ibrahim. And now... And now, la, la, this is Hassan you're talking about, and this is Sayyid, this is Ibn Hada Sayyid, this is Hassan and Hussein. I'll have to look this report up. I don't know of this report. So, we're getting there, we're getting there. Isbir Sabran Jamila. So, uh, and where was I? And so I said that uh, all, of his, uh, all of his children had passed away other than uh, Fatima uh, at this point in time. So all three of his daughters and his son or two sons from the past. We don't know how many Khadija had, either one or two or three. And of course, uh, uh, Khadija and others have passed away. So the very last year of his life, Allah Azza wa Jal tests him one more time. All of this is to demonstrate, to raise his ranks in Jannah, for, for him to be a role model uh, for us. And what is perhaps even more amazing than all of this is that on the day of the death of Ibrahim, as reported in uh, the Musnad of at tayalisi on the day of the death of Ibrahim, uh, there was a solar eclipse. There was a solar eclipse that within a few hours, Ibrahim dies in the morning, within a few hours, there's a solar eclipse. And 
the fact that there is an eclipse is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, uh, but it's not, the, if Ibrahim is not mentioned, the death of Ibrahim. Other books of hadith mention that took place on the day Ibrahim died. And the people began to say that the sun is grieving at the sorrow of the Prophet Because he was sad, because he was crying. So even the sun is sad. And the sun is shielding itself because it is crying. So the news spread in Medina that the sun is crying because of the death of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu son. And so uh, the Prophet Sallallahu gathered all of the people together and he gave a khutbah. And this khutbah is recorded in Bukhari and Muslim. And he said, Inna shamsa wal qamara ayatani min ayatillahi ta'ala. The sun and the moon are two of the miracles of Allah. La kasifani. They don't have an eclipse. Limauti ahadin hayati. When somebody is born or somebody dies, so when you see an eclipse, then hasten to do dhikr of Allah and perform the salah. And this incident is reported in Bukhari and Muslim. This khutbah is found in Bukhari and Muslim. As I said, the death of Ibrahim is not linked to the eclipse in Bukhari. But it is in the Musnad of Abu, Day uh, Abu Dawud the Tarisi. So other books of Hadith mentioned it happened on the same day. But the khutbah in Bukhari is very clear. That the Prophet is saying the sun does not eclipse because of the birth or the death of anybody. Why would he say that unless there is a birth and a death taking place? And of course it was the death of his own son. And to me, it is incidents like these that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. That our Prophet Muhammad was a sincere Prophet. That he didn't even have to repel against the rumors. He didn't have to negate the rumors. He didn't have to do anything. He could have just been quiet. I mean, what does it lose him? If those people say he's a false prophet, how does he lose anything? Let the rumors spread. It's good, let the people say. Let the world know that the son is crying because of my son. My, the death of my son. Right? But subhanAllah, he can't because he is Rasulullah. And he has to preach the truth. And so he calls the people together. And he literally says to them that the moon and the sun don't eclipse because of the birth of anybody or the death of anybody. Even my own son. That's independent of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to me, this clearly demonstrates the sincerity of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is one of millions of evidences that really, you know, we have to put into context, even if certain incidents like this are difficult to explain. And yes, for our cultural paradigm, it is difficult. But wallahi, how do you explain this? How do you explain this? That the miracle of the eclipse is taking place. And he says, no, no, it's not a miracle. Don't. It's just a coincidence. It's just a complete coincidence. This to me is a clear sign of the uh, sincerity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, the fact that Ibrahim um, could not become a young man and an adult uh, is something that one can say has already been decreed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala explicitly in the Quran. Because Allah says in the Quran, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِينَ This verse was revealed before the birth of Ibrahim. This verse of Surah Al-Ahzab was revealed before the birth of Ibrahim. And it translates as, Muhammad وسلم, is not the father of any of your men. He is not the father of any of your men. Now if Ibrahim had become a young man, this would have contradicted the verse. But Ibrahim, and notice here the precision of the Quran. Allah didn't say he is not a father. He didn't say he's not a father to a child or a, a boy. The word is very clear. Look at how precise the verse is. Muhammad is not the father of any of your rijal. And rijal is by definition a grown man. Okay. And if Allah Azza wa Jal, or if the Quran had said he is not a father to any, any boy, any man. Meaning a man, meaning a, a mawlud let's say. Because the Quran also uses the word mawlud. Right? Mawludi, right? The, the word mawlud could mean anything. Boy, girl, baby, anything. And that's what you call a baby. But Allah didn't say he's not the father of any baby or the father of any child or the father of any offspring. Rather, Allah used a very precise word. And subhanAllah, 
Ibrahim was never a rajul. Ibrahim was always a walad. He was a mawlud, he was a baby. And so Allah Azza wa has already clearly said, your prophet is not going to be the father of any man amongst you. And therefore, one could say that theologically, uh, or you know, from the Quran, it's impossible. Then there's another report as well, which is very interesting. And that is a report found in Ibn Majah from Anas ibn Malik that the Prophet is reported to have said that uh, when Ibrahim died, he said that Allah has given him a wet nurse, a murdi'a in Jannah. So there's somebody to take care of him in Jannah. If Ibrahim had lived, he would have been a righteous prophet. Now this hadith is reported in Ibn Majah. And some of our scholars, including Shaykh al-Albani, have made it uh, Hassan. Uh, but uh, the majority of scholars, and this is the position I lean towards as well, and Allah knows best, it is not a statement of the Prophet, it's a statement of Anas ibn Malik. It's a statement of Anas ibn Malik. And this is actually proven uh, in other narrations, Muslim, Ahmad and others, they mention it upon Anas as a statement from him. And this makes more sense. That Anas ibn Malik said, and other Sahaba said, that if Ibrahim had lived, he would have been a... Prophet. And this is a statement from them, that's an ishtihad that, that how could a prophet, how could the son of the Prophet not be other than a, uh, a prophet? So this is a, an ishtihad from Anas ibn Malik, it's not the strongest opinion, it is not a hadith. Also, one can also add here that there is a political wisdom in not having male lineage of the Prophet wasallam because there's no doubt that if there was male lineage, then Immediately, that would have been the next Khalifa and the next Khalifa, the next Khalifa, and whatnot. As it is, look at the controversies that erupted from the descendants of the Prophet through his daughter. Look at how groups formed. Look at how groups ex exalted the status of the Al al Bayt to above what is even human. And this Al al Bayt, they are Al al Bayt. We respect and admire them. But there's a big difference between us and the Shia. For us, we say the Al al Bayt are special and blessed if they are holy. Whereas the, the bulk of the Shia say the Al al Bayt are special and blessed because they are holy. In other words, if you are Al al Bayt, you are automatically blessed and holy. Whereas for us, if you are a descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu that does not make you a righteous man in and of itself. Blood does not make you righteous. Your good deeds will make you righteous. So if you have good deeds and you are al al bayt, the nurun ala nur, you have a double. But if you're not a good person, then your blood will not save you. And if, if that were the case, then all of us are the children of prophets. We are children of Nuh, we're children of Adam, all of us are children of prophets, right? Every human being is a son or daughter of Nuh, directly. Every human being is obviously son or daughter of Adam. So we don't believe that being children of prophets automatically makes you holy. Even if it is the Prophet and frankly, all you need to do is look at historically the descendants of the Prophet in the 8th, 10th, 15th generation in our times, right? Some of the rulers of countries in our times have authentic lineages to the Prophet Look at what they or their father or their grandfather, you know what I'm talking about here, you know? Look at what they have done, sold their countries and whatnot to, I mean, it doesn't matter. Wallahi, it doesn't matter. If your lineage is, is holy or blessed, but you are an unrighteous man, it's not gonna... And this is a hadith, of course, in Tirmidhi, uh, that uh, man Whosoever's good deeds hold him back, his lineage will not push him forward. Whosoever's good deeds hold him back, his lineage will not push him forward. This is what the Prophet himself is saying. Doesn't matter who your ancestors are. If you don't have the good deeds, you don't have the uh, good deeds. And so, uh, we believe that uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah will that he pass away, he die. And perhaps there is truth in this as well, that if he had lived, he would have been a prophet. Uh, there's one more incident narrated about Maria, and then we are done with the story of Maria. And uh, this is an incident that the books of uh, Tafsir mention more than the books of Sirah. Because the Quran was revealed uh, for this incident, and therefore uh, the books of, of Tafsir mention this story. Uh, and once again, so with Maria, there's all of these mini stories that are problematic from one perspective, and this is also one of them. And again, I reiterated it better you hear it from me than from others. And also, this is in the Quran. 
So you can't really like this is a verse in the Quran. It is reported in uh, al Tabari uh, that and many other books of Tafsir that one day Hafsa uh, went away and she was not going to be uh, at home. And so uh, the Prophet called Maria to the house of Hafsa. And it so happened that Hafsa returned earlier than she was supposed to and she saw Maria leaving her house. So she became extremely enraged and she became irritated. Uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu and she said that Ya Rasulullah, uh, is that how much, uh, how do I translate this, respect you have for me or is that what you think of me uh, in my house and on my day? And so the Prophet Sallallahu continued to placate her and calm her down uh, and she basically was very emotional and until eventually she made the Prophet Sallallahu uh, promise to never ever see Maria again. And the Prophet said, I have made her haram for myself. Okay? Okay, khalas, I give up basically. Maria is haram for me. I will never see Maria. I swear to Allah, by Allah, I'm never going to see Maria again. And he told Hafsa, he made Hafsa basically keep this between the two of them. And he said, do not tell Aisha. And this shows, and this is, here's the point here that these types of incidents, uh, the image that some Muslims have of our Prophet Sallallahu literally makes him superhuman. So when they hear these narrations, the image they have formed in their minds crumbles. And the problem comes that this image should not have been in their minds. Our Prophet Sallallahu was he human or not? For sure he was, right? He was the best human, he was the perfect human, but in the end of the day, he's a human being. And so, yes, he wanted Maria, and he, it is halal for him to have Maria. And he now is, wants to placate Hafsa, so he promises not to see. And he does not want Aisha to find out. Every husband here understands exactly the fear of a wife, what it can do, right? This is the reality as well, okay? So there's nothing wrong with this image at all. But the first time somebody hears it, again, because of the image that they have constructed, something is wrong. But in reality, this is human nature. All of this is completely human. And there's nothing haram that he has done. There's nothing sinful. Our Prophet did not you know, commit any sin of this nature. So he makes Hafsa promise not to tell Aisha. Hafsa, of course, she goes and tells Aisha. She spills the beans. Why would she tell Aisha? Can anybody explain the psychology? Uh. <laughs> Why don't you raise your voice? <laughs> no, not that. Why would she tell Aisha then? No. To make Aisha jealous of her that I caused the process of them to give up, to give up uh, uh, Maria. Clear? Right? And of course, the two of them, they had their spats and they were, they were sometimes the best of friends and sometimes the worst of enemies, right? So Hafsa and Aisha had a very interesting relationship. Uh, whereas other wives, they never got along. Zainab and Aisha never got along. Never. But Hafsa and Aisha, at times they were the best of friends and at times they were at each other. And so this is like trying to, trying to show Aisha that I was the one who got Maria out of the picture. And the both of them were jealous of Maria. Right? Maria was a beautiful lady. And... Uh, it was because of this, as our, our, uh, was mentioned, it was because of this that the process and moved her to Awali, far away. Otherwise, the other wives were around the masjid. So, moved her away to far away place that there's no direct uh, interaction. So, uh, she makes, sorry, he makes uh, Hafsa promise not to tell. Hafsa goes and tells and spills the beans. Then what happens? Allah reveals in the Quran. Allah reveals in the Quran. That's why we're talking about it right here. And Allah reveals, what is He revealed? Which surah? Surah Tahrim. 
Okay, Surah Al-Tahrim. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, O Prophet, lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu lak? Why are you making haram what Allah has made halal for you? Meaning what? Maria, tabtaghi mardata azwajik. You do it in order to please your wife. So you make haram what Allah had made halal simply to please your wife. Wallahu ghafoor rahim. And Allah Azza wa is forgiving and merciful, right? قَدْ فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ تَحِلَّةَ أَيْمَانِكُمْ Allah has obligated on you to get rid of your oath. What was the oath? Never see again. So how do you get rid of the oath? You fast or you give a raqaba. Basically, there is a method in the Quran. You feed the poor, you fast, you give a... a you. So Allah is saying, I have obligated on you now to get rid of this oath. Don't make haram what Allah has made halal for you. قَدْ فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ تَحِلَّةَ إِمَانِكُمْ وَاللَّهُ مَوْلَاكُمْ And Allah is your protector. وَهُوَ الْعَلِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ وَإِذْ أَسَرَّ النَّبِيُّ إِلَى بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِي حَدِيثًا And when the Prophet told one of his wives a, a secret. This is Hafsa. Right? And he told her it's a secret, a sarra. Falamma nabbaaha bihi, qalat man anbaaka hada. So there's a missing clause that's understood. So she spilled the secret. She spilled the beans. So when the Prophet told her, why did you spill the beans? Why did you tell somebody? Why did you tell Hafsa? Uh, why did you tell Aisha, right? Qalat man anbaaka hada. Hafsa says, who told you? I told Aisha. How did you know? Now what is Hafsa thinking? Aisha. Aisha is stabbing me in the back now. Aisha is now coming and telling the whole thing. So Hafsa getting jealous now. Man anba'aka hadha? Who told you that I told her? Right? Because it's only me and her, nobody else. And so, قَالَ نَبَّأَنِيَ الْعَلِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ Allah told me. Right? إِن تَتُوبَ إِلَى اللَّهِ فَقَدْ سَغَدْ قُلُوبُكُمَا So Allah says, the both of you, what you did, in trying to basically make yourselves better and, and what that, the both of you, if you repent to Allah, even if you repent, your hearts have inclined towards what it doesn't say, but meaning to deprive him of the halal. فَقَدْ سَغَدْ قُلُوبُكُمَا وَإِن تَظَاهَرَ عَلَيْهِ And if the two of you dare cooperate against him, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ مَوْلَاهُ Allah is his protector. وَجِبْرِيلُ وَصَالِحُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And the righteous believers. And that's Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. The righteous believers and Ali. وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ ظَهِيرُ And after the righteous believers, even the angels. So this is a verse that is meant to uh, bring some fear to the wise of the Prophet Don't conspire against him. Don't go behind backs and now trying to... Allah knows what you are doing. And there is no denying that Allah Azza wa Jal is... Showing the status of our Prophet even to his wives. Even to his wives he is showing that. That he is not like a normal person. Of course he's a normal human being, but you get my point. He's not. The hukuk are much more. The hukuk of this husband are much more than the hukuk of any husband. So that's why the warning comes down very clearly. That even if you repent, you have already wanted to commit some crime. Right? Meaning Allah will forgive you, but you shouldn't have done that. And if you are going to continue down this path and conspire against him, then Allah Azza wa Jal will protect him. And the righteous people and Jibreel and uh, the uh, uh, Malaika are behind after that as well. Now, uh, so because of this, uh, Allah revealed the command to break the oath. And so uh, he broke the oath, he gave the kafara. And so Maria uh, returned to him. Now, there is an alternative version. There's two opinions about Surah Al-Tahrim. This opinion of Maria is really the strongest one and the correct one. There is an alternative that some of the Sahaba posited. And this is that it involves, uh, it involves uh, some honey that was given to him by Sauda and Aisha and Hafsa conspired. The fact of the matter, yes, the story is mentioned. But the fact of the matter is that it doesn't fit and follow all of the the verses, the, the, the secret and the two of you conspiring and whatnot, it doesn't fit as perfectly as the story of, of Maria. And also, uh, it doesn't seem that big of a deal if the Prophet says, I'm never going to eat honey again. Versus the issue of Maria, it makes perfect sense. Why would the wives get so jealous about spending 20 minutes extra because he had honey? Because the, the other story goes that he had honey at the house of one of the wives and so they got very jealous that he's having honey. And that doesn't it doesn't fit as perfectly as the story of uh, Maria. Now, by the way, some scholars say, oh, uh, these personal issues of the Prophet's house are private matters. They should be left alone. We shouldn't talk about them. 
But to respond to this, we say, if Allah had wanted to, He could have had kept it private. But He revealed Surah Tahrim because of it. So there is a wisdom for us in it. And there was much wahi that was private. This wahi is public. And also, this is not the custom even of the Sahaba. So we have Ibn Abbas, for example, uh, saying that I was waiting for an opportunity from Umar ibn al-Khattab for months, for years, to ask about uh, Surah Tahrim until uh, finally one opportunity came, he said, and I found Umar all by myself. So I basically jumped on him and said immediately, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, who are the two women in Surah Tahrim? So he's asking, who are the two women? And Umar ibn al-Khattab says, Aisha and Hafsa, his own daughter. And look at the honesty. This is his own daughter that Allah is saying. So if he wanted to keep it private, he could have said, none of your business, young man. You know, don't ask. Imagine if anybody wants to keep it private, it's Umar. But it's Allah revealing in the Quran. And Ibn Abbas is eager to find out. Remember Ibn Abbas was 12, 13 years old. He doesn't, he will learn his ilm after the death of the Prophet He will study after the, so this is his eagerness. He wants to ask Umar. So Umar tells him this is what uh, happened. And so uh, therefore, I think that, uh, and if you look at the story of Maria, I mean, wallahi, there's so much benefit uh, from us to see that even the uh, wives of the Prophet they were, yes, they were regular human beings. They felt jealous about their husband like every wife would. Uh, that our process is a human being. And here's the whole point is that if we portray him the way that our books of Sirah portray him, then everything fits into place. But if we make an imaginary perspective and we formulate a person who never actually existed, then when we read the books of Sirah or when some person comes and gives us an incident, it completely shakes our understanding. And I think this is a problem. And I think if you listen, and this is one of my goals really of this whole seerah, is to increase iman of our, of our young brothers and sisters. To make them realize the true message of our Prophet ﷺ. To not make him into something that he wasn't. He, did, he didn't do anything wrong. He's a human being. And he has halal access to Maria. Okay, Hafsa has the right to get irritated. Yes, we understand that. It's her house. She has the right to get irritated. right? But technically, he didn't do haram. And our Prophet did not commit haram, right? He did something that, yes, Hafsa, we can understand 100% sympathize with her. But then, when she had the sympathy of the Prophet what did she do? She took it more than she needed to, right? And she went beyond what would have been appropriate. And so, when she did this, and then she felt she had accomplished something, she goes to Aisha, so then Allah Azza wa Jal reveals against the two of them that you went beyond right and of course they are forgiven they are our mothers but to me to portray this picture and to give the real image wallahi to me i can love and respect the process him even more because he's now accessible to me rather than to make him into a superhuman or something that as if he's not from this world as if he's a walking nur of allah on earth no he's a human being and he has desires and those desires he controls them in a halal manner and there's nothing wrong with satisfying one's desires in a halal manner. Our Prophet never committed a sin of that nature. And so here he has this, he does it, and it's understandable. Hafsa gets irritated at him. But as we said, Hafsa took too much advantage. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed that why would you make haram what Allah Azza wa Jal has made halal? And so uh, that is the story of Maria. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, Maria lived for only. Uh, four years or maybe five years after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so she died relatively early relatively young in the Khilaf of Umar ibn al-Khattab maybe the 16th or the 15th year of the Hijrah she passed away and Umar ibn al-Khattab prayed Janazah for her and they buried her in Baqi' and therefore this shows us that she clearly converted to Islam that there's no doubt she converted to Islam she died a Muslimah uh, when did she convert? I would assume she converted before the birth of Ibrahim. But this is just an assumption. Allah knows best. We don't know. I don't know for sure. Uh, and if anybody finds any details about this, then please benefit me in this regard. Any quick questions? We've gone beyond our mark. Any quick questions about Maria? Yes. It's not a husband, technically. 
You understand? You understand? You don't understand? No. Uh, so the opposite, the, the husband and the wife form a couple. The nikah takes place. In this case, Maria is not a wife. Maria is a milk yameen. Okay, so we just don't use the term husband. Okay, so when will she become free? At the death of uh, the owner. No, because the nikah, there was no nikah. There was no nikah. It's not, it's not a wife. That's why I'm, that's what I'm saying your terminology is incorrect. There was, see, this is the whole point. This is what you call a concubine, a milk yameen. Illa ma malakat aymanukum. So milk yameen has different rulings in Islam. And uh, Maria was never a wife. No nikah was ever performed. Therefore, she's not considered to be a mother of the believers. She becomes free and nobody can marry her. Other, otherwise, if any other ummah walid was there, then somebody could marry. But because it's our process, nobody can marry her, but she's not a wife. Okay, any other quick questions? Going once, going... Why did he not make dua for Khadija, for Abu Talib? He made dua, Allah Azza wa did not accept for Abu Talib. So, with his qadr Allah, and just because he is the process, he does, he does not snap his fingers and say, kun fayakun. Correct? And Allah says in the Quran, you're not going to be the father of any man. He knew the verse. He knew the verse. And that's probably what he meant when he said, were it not for the qadr of Allah. Maybe this is what his intention was. I knew this would happen. This is the qadr of Allah. Okay. Inshallah, yes. I agree with you, but don't you agree with me that that's dangerous in modern times? I don't disagree with that. But right? It's not, it's not an image, for example, that I created. I see what you're saying. So it is an image that was created for you by your elders, yes. by your Sunday school teachers. Yes. And be very frank here, maybe a hundred years ago, let it pass by. Right? No big deal. But I just think it is very dangerous. Very dangerous in our times to have this false image because we are being bombarded and nothing is better than the truth. Nothing is better to defend than the truth. Sometimes the truth is a bit awkward, but honestly, all of the incidents today, I don't see it as being that awkward, frankly. You know, it's something minutiae, things here and there, Nothing really at the character of the Prophet ﷺ himself. The issue of Jawari, of, of Milk Yameen, everybody did it. Everybody in human history. Nothing special for the Prophet ﷺ, okay? Some things Madia did, okay, she wasn't a Muslim at the time, she was new, and it turned out to be false. Okay, I mean, you know, it's not affecting. And then the issue of Hafsa as well. I mean, it's, he's a human being. It's halal. You know, there's nothing there that's, that's that. So, to me, this story is not... As problematic as some one or two other ones, but nonetheless, people have different issues of of what's problematic. So, I'd rather you hear it from me and we explain it in the proper manner than gloss over it and then you know face problems later later on. Inshallah.